We're back with another AMD CPU from the new stack. This is the Ryzen 5 5500. It is very disappointing for the price. $160. It drops PCIe Gen 4 down to Gen 3, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but it hurts a little bit. And its chief competition is the i3-12100 and 12100F. The 12100F comes in at $122 and will save you some time. In gaming, it pretty much universally outperforms the R5-5500 while being a lot cheaper. So this review is an instance of looking at AMD trying to sit on its mountain of expensive CPUs for a little too long and shipping this thing about at least six months to a year later than probably it would have been the most relevant. Uh, so let's review the Ryzen 5 5500 and see how it goes from here. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Montec Sentry 850 Gold Power Supply. The Sentry 850 Watt is an 80 plus gold certified power supply, also available in 550 Watt and 650 Watt capacities at generally competitive prices with the rest of the market. The Sentry 850 Watt includes a five year warranty, two EPS 12 volt connectors, six PCIe cables, and plenty of peripheral cables, making it easy to scale this modular power supply up or down for your build. Learn more at the link in the description below. So that's the pricing then. This is supposed to land at $160. The i3-12100F right now when we're filming this is $122 online in the US. And the i3-12100 non-F, so the one with the IGP, the integrated graphics processor, that is $140, $150. Both cheaper options. Now technically, although they are called i3s, the modern version of an i3 is much more comparable to an old, old i7. So they've been upgraded a lot in the last couple of years, and they shouldn't be written off just because of the i3 naming. Of course, they're still the lowest end of the Intel Core i-series stack. The i5-12400 is a CPU that we call the good value. The i3-12100F is the CPU we call the best budget CPU, in that it still provides a good frame rate in just about every game we tested while being the cheapest. Maybe it won't last quite as long as an i5-12400, or more notably, a 12100 is more limited in its production and workstation capabilities, doing things like rendering, uh, code compile, compression, decompression, especially AMD does better there at, in just about every CPU and similar prices. But the 12100 is a very strong gaming solution. So AMD has got a hell of a fight cut out for it. 19 megabytes of cache is a big step down from the 35 megabytes of total cache listed for the R5-5600. And of course, the 5600X is up there as well. The frequencies have the 5500 at 4.2 gigahertz for the advertised boost and 3.6 for the base frequency with the 5600 at 4.4 for boost and 3.5 for base. Uh, the 5600X is a little bit higher than that still. But even though this is called an R5 and it has the same core and thread count as the other R5s, Again, that big difference is in the PCIe generation. We'll see that show up a little bit in some of the gaming benchmarks. That'll be more relevant as a concern as we ramp into the RTX 40 series of cards, which will be PCIe Gen 5. It's coming up quickly, mind you. But uh, as for today, there are some things that are reasonable to sacrifice to stay on a budget. PCI generation can be one of them because if you're buying $160 or below CPU, it's unlikely you're buying GPUs that come anywhere close to the full limit of PCIe Gen 3 by 16 anyway, but it, at some level it feels a little bad to buy something that's now going to be two generations old uh, very soon. Architecturally though, the 5500 is the last of the modern architectures for AMD's Zen 3 CPUs. Uh, it will only be succeeded by the 5800X 3D as we understand it now, with the new AMD CPUs and totally different motherboards coming out after that. Below it again is Zen 2 stuff, which we'll be looking at. The 5500, to be honest with you, was one of the worst performing for the money that we've looked at in quite a while from AMD. It's disappointing to see, for sure. Definitely feels like too little too late. And the only one we suspect will review worse on our channel is the 4500, which has been horrible to work with. Anyway, let's get started with the review of the 5500. You can find out why we weren't big fans of it, and uh, then we'll talk about what your options are. Checking on the frequencies helps us ensure everything is running right, so here that is. The R5-5500 had an exceptionally flat frequency, indicating that no limits are in play, other than those set firmly by AMD. It ran at 4251 MHz for the entire test, and this is an all-core workload in Blender, so it should result in the lowest loaded frequencies we reasonably see. The R5-5600 ran at about 4317 MHz for reference, you can see it's fluctuating a lot more as well, with the 5600X at 4400 megahertz. Compared to the marketing specs, the R5-5500 is running about 50 megahertz higher than is technically advertised. 
This is a good spot to be at least, and as a recovery from AMD's CPUs a few years ago that struggled to hit some of the advertised frequencies. Over-delivering is a good start, and is also how AMD started the 5000 series. We next logged the single core frequency maximum per interval. The R5 5500 maxed out at 4250 MHz, with the R5 5600 at 4450 MHz. The 5600X held at 4650 MHz, giving us a fairly clean gap of 200 MHz between each CPU, certainly making it look more contrived as a product. Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p will start our gaming benchmarks. This one has the AMD R5 5500 at 410 FPS average, in an absolute sense that's high, but we're looking for the comparative difference between this and alternatives. There's no point paying more or equivalent for something that's worse. The AMD R5 5600 runs at 476 FPS average, an improvement of 16% for about $40 MSRP higher. More importantly, the R5 5500 loses to the Intel i3 12100F in what's an embarrassing defeat for AMD. The 5500 allows the 12100F a lead of 2.6%, but the 5500 is also $40 more expensive than what we paid for the 12100F. You can get the i3-12100 with the IGP, not even the F version, for cheaper than the R5-5500. And that gives you an IGP, at least for troubleshooting or something. So this is just straight up bad for AMD. Rainbow Six marks a clear and firm loss in value proposition and performance versus the Intel competition, despite the stronger start from the R5-5600. AMD's R5-5500 is too little, too late. At 1440p, in spite of the obvious heavier workload on the GPU, the R5-5500 drops down some more. The 5500 plots worse than a 2700X here, and overall loses rank. We think some of this could be tied to the cache, where the cache total drops to 19 megabytes on the R5-5500 versus 35 on the likes of the 5600. We reran the 5500 an additional four times and found it still is in this disproportionately low position, specifically when run at 1440p for this game. The i3-12100F has an 8% lead in this one, so it's doing pretty well. Cyberpunk 2077 is up now, a heavier game to run. This one has the R5-5500 at 142 FPS average, which positions it about equal with the i3-12100F in average frame rate and in lows. AMD must be playing 4D chess or something, because we don't understand the moves it's making. Maybe it's decided to factor in inflation for the year of 2077 also, because the price doesn't make sense otherwise. The 5600 leads the 5500 by 18%, with the 12100F making the best value argument here, and the 5600 and 12400 making good points for higher-end CPUs. There's just no room for the 5500 on this chart. It's outdone on all flanks. F1 2021 is another heavily CPU-bound game, but only lower down the stack. We've recently started rerunning it to accommodate patches. The R5 5500 CPU ran at 295 FPS average, with lows proportional to the rest of the game's performance, and at 195. The R5 5500 is outdone by the i3 12100F by 1.7%. Again, not a big advantage. It's not like it's a meaningful difference to the player, but given how much cheaper it is, there's a lot to be had there. It's already clear how this review is going at this point, and it looks like it's continuing down that path. AMD is getting equated by a cheaper part, and a $40 difference could go towards anything else in the computer that would be more valuable, even just the cooler or something to make it quieter. The R5 5500 should have come out over a year ago, but instead, AMD decided to sit on its mountain of expensive CPUs and wait for competition to come to it, rather than actively trying to cut off the path that competition could take. So the 5500 has no value here. Counter-Strike Go brings us back to FPS games that are frame rate sensitive. The R5 5500 ran at 248 FPS average, with lows spaced similarly to the other results, so in the very least, we're not seeing major frame time consistency issues. That's where the positives end, though. This is a game where AMD has historically, in our testing, held a bit of an advantage. You can see that at the high end of this chart. The R5 5500 can't even capitalize on the natural advantages that the other AMD CPUs have here, and it allows the 12100F to hold a lead in average FPS. The lows are within error of each other, at least, but the lead in average is 1.3%. So, again, it's not a lot of performance difference until the price is factored in. The R5 5500 is shaping up to be, at this point, an utter waste of time, 
and more importantly of goodwill that AMD has earned. The marketing energy that AMD has benefited from, provided by its more competitive parts, are just getting sapped away by this one. At 1440p, things really don't improve. The R5-5500 is still about the same as an i5-11400. It's still worse than the i3-12100F, now with the 12100F about 4.2% ahead, so the gap is growing. And it's actually even about tied with the R5-3600. We are vexed that AMD decided to put its name on the 5500. It's not atrocious in the sense that the part is performing well, it's not black screening like our 4500 has been doing, but its price to performance certainly drags down the rest of the launches this week. In Red Dead Redemption 2 at 1080p, the AMD R5-5500 ran at 143fps average, behind the i5-11400 and about tied with the R7-3700X. This is the only game so far where it has outperformed the 12100F, but it's only ahead by 2.4% here. That means you're paying about $22 for every 1% increase. Great work, AMD. Truly revolutionizing value in a direction that, until now, only NVIDIA has done best in. Far Cry 6 is up now. The game is more demanding than some of the others, so frame rate is lower by comparison. But the load on the CPU remains high enough to see scaling all the way up to the 12900K. The AMD R5-5500 ran at about 108 FPS average here, with lows again spaced appropriately. Unfortunately, it's still about tied with the 3600 and the 3700X, and more unfortunately, it allows the 12100F to lead by 8.7%. Given the price gap, that's not even close to be considered competitive. Blender rendering is up next, using the same tile-based cycles renderer as we always use here. In this test, we expect to see a reduced impact from cache and a higher focus on purely threads and frequency, which will benefit the 5500 comparatively. The R5-5500 required 24 minutes to complete the render, meaning the 5600 needs about 6% less time. Here, the 5500 looks like a better value when compared to the 5600 as opposed to previous tests. And unlike in games, the 12100F finally takes a back seat. The 5500 leads by 22% over the 12100F, finally providing a real advantage. Unfortunately, it doesn't leave much room for the 5500 to be relevant. In games, it's too behind from the cache limitations. In production workloads, it seems an odd price point for anyone truly focused on this kind of work. Adobe Premiere is up now. This one is scoring rendering, scrubbing playback, filtering, and other features in aggregate. The R5-5500 sits between the 3600 and the 12400, with the R5-5600 offering an insignificant 5% lead here. The i3-12100F slips again in this one. Its weakness, as we said in the review of the 12100, is and will remain production workloads. Anything thread-heavy will affect the 12100F disproportionately. Photoshop is up now. In this test, the 5500 scored 951 points, ranking it back below the 12100F, though not by much. The R5-5500 is less convincing here than it was in other production tests, uh, but the 5600 comes in and leads by 10%, with the 12100F leading only by 1.2%. Chromium code compile tests are up now. We're testing the time required in minutes to complete the Chromium code base when using these CPUs. Historically, we've seen a benefit from higher cache in this testing as well. The R5-5500 took 119 minutes to complete the compile, which planted it behind the R7-2700X and actually significantly behind the R5-3600, which has 32 megabytes of cache to the 5500's 19. We think this is likely the culprit for the behavior, and that's further reinforced by the 5600's relatively close positioning to the 3600 previously. In 7-zip compression, the 5500 outdid the 12400 marginally, it led the 2700X, and it gapped majorly over the i3-12100F. As we said in the 5600 review, compression and decompression are areas that AMD does really well in with the current generation of Intel versus AMD. The 5600, just for reference, jumps ahead by 10%. In 7-zip decompression, the Intel CPUs predictably fell further down the charts. This is known behavior where the current Intel offerings just don't compete that well here. If you're doing a lot of decompression work specifically, you should be looking to AMD, not Intel right now. The gap between the 5500 and the 5600 isn't too large, but the comparison to the 12100F or 12400 strongly favors these new AMD CPUs. Power consumption testing will close things out for this review. The results are expected, but still interesting. In Blender testing first, the R5-5500 ended up about the same as the 5600 and the 5600X, despite its overall lower performance. This is similar to what we saw in the 5900X versus the 5950X previously, where the better binned CPUs can maintain higher frequencies at lower vCore, despite sometimes, like in the 5950X's case, having higher core count as well. 
The 5500 just needs more voltage to maintain its lower frequencies than the 56 peers, so it ends up consuming proportionally more power. It's still relatively efficient overall, though. In Cinebench multi-threaded rendering, the AMD power consumption metrics remain about the same. We're at 71 watts here versus 66 watts on the other recent CPUs. The Intel numbers go up a bit where multiple power limits exist, but overall the most relevant comparison is the 12100F, and that one remains more efficient than the 5500 in gaming applications considering the power used. Wrapping up then, at $160, the R5 5500 is simply not worth it. If you're gaming, only especially, then the 12100 is a far better choice. Performs a little bit better, but you save a lot of money. It's $40 cheaper if you go for the 12100F. You can even get an IGP, which AMD doesn't have on its Ryzen CPUs of uh, this class, and spend still a little bit less money. So the 5500 is simply just not worth it. We could not find the value. In production workloads, it has strengths versus an i3-12100F. That is to be expected. Maybe there's an argument there. If you're really on a strict budget and some reason you have exactly $160 max you can spend on a CPU that is capable of regular rendering, that's about it. But at the same time, if you're considering that for your, your rendering daily option, you really need to think about can you stretch up to uh, 5600 or a 5700X especially. It's a big jump, but people who are doing enough production workloads, enough professional workloads to want a 5500 over a 12100, those are the people who are generally going to be at least making a little bit of money or plan to make money with their computer. And in that scenario, we think it's worth considering the higher end CPUs instead. But for anyone who's really mostly looking at a gaming PC with splashing some other stuff in there now and then, the 12100F just dominates it here. AMD is way too late with the 5500. It's embarrassing how late AMD came out with the CPU, considering how long of a lead they had against AMD. They, they had forever to launch this thing, and they just never did it because they were never pressured. So, uh, yeah, this one gets a pass from us. Check out our 5600 review. It's a little more positive. And then we've got the 5700X and the 4500 coming up as well. Thank you for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly, and we'll see you all next time.